Miami. It's a massive core of urbanization, an enormous American metropolis that's the fourth largest in the United States. Unless, of course, you look at another list of American cities, which would place it a little further down the list, this time at number nine. Look at yet another, and the capital of Latin America has plummeted to 44th place, down behind Colorado Springs in Mesa, Arizona. While counting the population of a state or a country is pretty straightforward, just look at their set boundaries, there are multiple different methods for determining what a city should be considered to encompass, how far those boundaries should stretch, and each can lead to some pretty different results, like Miami going from one of the largest cities in the country to more of an afterthought. The differences between these definitions of a city don't always seem to be fully understood. One of the most common comments I get on my US Explained videos are that I've made glaring errors in the city populations I provide, usually citing city proper or metro area populations that are in fact quite far off from the numbers I gave. And I get it. City population can be a big point of pride. New Yorkers love that they're the biggest, and for other cities, might they be in the top 10 or be the largest in their state, it's the same way. Because the classification I use, the urban area, isn't as well known as the other two, it's totally understandable that it might be cause for confusion. In this video, I'm going to dive into these three urban population classifications used in the United States, the city proper, the urban area, and the metropolitan area. I'll give the best case pitch for the use of each one and then dive into the numerous flaws with each. I'm not going to pretend that I don't have a horse in this race. I use the urban area in each of my videos and think it's the best way to measure an urban population, but it isn't without its problems either, and at the end of the day, I want you to be able to make your own decision on what we should consider when counting our centers of population, and to be able to understand the fundamental differences between each. Hello and welcome to That Is Interesting. I'm your host Carter. Today, the problems with how we measure cities. I know, some of you have had it on the tip of your tongue. Maybe you already said it in a comment. You're wrong, Carter. We do have a way to measure cities. Just like a state or a country, cities have boundaries, city limits. You drive in and there's a sign telling you when you get there and how many people live there. That's it. Case closed. And you're right. If our question is strictly what is a city and how many people live there, this is the obvious answer. Just consider how many people live within the city limits, and that's that. New York City is New York City, Chicago is Chicago, Grand Forks, North Dakota is Grand Forks, North Dakota, and nothing else. Our New Rochelles, Naperville's, East Grand Forks, these should be treated as entirely separate entities from our core cities. This is our first method, the city proper, and it's easily the most well-known, the one we always think of. This is where we get that famous 8 million number for New York. Further down the line, it's where we get things like Kansas City as Missouri's largest city, Jacksonville as Florida's largest, Huntsville the largest in Alabama, although a different look might give some different answers. The case for the city proper is that the suburbs are not part of the city, but fundamentally something different. And if you live in the suburbs, that's at least what you'll usually say when you're talking to other locals. You specify which city exactly you call home because suburbs are at the end of the day their own cities too, with their own names, governments, histories, often town centers, and city limits. Some have tall buildings and huge populations. What right does another city have to claim them just by being larger? With each of these three methods, we'll look at what they list as the 10 largest cities in the country to compare how they change with different measurements. For the city proper, bringing in the top three, we have New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago, with 8.3, 3.8, and 2.7 million residents each. These are the big three American cities, and luckily they are first, second, and third across each of these classifications, which makes our lives a little bit easier. Their populations, however, do differ pretty widely across all three. Continuing with the top 10 most populous city propers in the country, we have at number 4 Houston with 2.3 million people, followed by Phoenix and Philadelphia, in 5th and 6th both with around 1.6 million, in 7th San Antonio with 1.5 million, San Diego with 1.4 million, Dallas with 1.3 million, and rounding out the top 10, Austin with 974,000 people. As the saying goes, everything is bigger in Texas. And this is certainly the case when looking at city propers. 
four of the 10 largest cities on this list are all in Texas. This makes some sense. Texas's population is surpassed only by California. It's an indisputable population giant, but it has a particular advantage if we're looking at city propers. In fact, this is the case across the Sun Belt. The warmer climate southern part of the country that's grown rapidly in the last century as Americans moved south and west from the colder northeast and midwest, the traditional core of the American population. In fact, on this list, only three of the ten most populous city propers in the country, New York City, Chicago, and Philadelphia, are located in the country's northern half, while the other seven are all in its southeastern and southwestern portions, four in Texas, two in California, and one in Arizona. But the south of the country is not, at the end of the day, significantly more populous than the north. While there's a big east-west population divide, the northern and southern halves of the United States are roughly equivalent in population. The traditional southeastern and southwestern states are home to about 53% of all Americans, and some parts of these states stretch significantly past the midpoint of the country anyways. While the lower 48 states span nearly 25 degrees of latitude north to south, only about 2 degrees of latitude separate the lower 48's geographic center in Lebanon, Kansas, with the country's population center in Hartville, Missouri. So, while the American population is roughly evenly dispersed across the north and south, the country's largest city propers are largely centered on one side of the country. While many populations of mountain west states are heavily concentrated in cities, the answer really lies not in population, but in land area. The actual city limits of these southern cities are simply a lot larger than their northern counterparts. In fact, of the 20 American cities with the largest land areas, all but one are located in the southern or mountain west parts of the country. These cities are often far younger and have grown much more rapidly in recent years, and they've often been much more effective at expanding their city limits into what were once suburbs. Los Angeles, for example, secured water rights to the far-off Owens Valley in 1913, giving it a significant advantage over its neighbors when it came to the essential natural resource. It immediately embarked on a campaign of annexation, incorporating cities like those in the suburban San Fernando Valley, expanding to the beachfront, and doubling in size. Growing during the age of AC and the automobile, these cities grew with sprawl and expansion in mind. Some, like Tucson, have city limits that extend well beyond any developed areas, including miles and miles of uninhabited rural areas in their borders. In the meantime, in older, more densely populated northeastern and midwestern cities, suburbs are often old and historic towns with a sense of independence and local identity, as opposed to the newer, planned communities with cul-de-sacs and strip malls that are more common throughout the Sun Belt. With a stronger sense of identity, these towns are often more opposed to annexation. If we look at urban areas, which include both cities and their suburbs, Austin and Pittsburgh have roughly the same populations, 1.8 and 1.74 million, respectively. But while the city proper of Pittsburgh takes up 58 square miles, the city proper of Austin takes up five and a half times more land, at 326 square miles. Because of this, the Austin city proper, unsurprisingly, has a population three times the size of Pittsburgh. While this video is focused on U.S. cities, the physical size of a city proper has created difficulties in how we measure cities around the world as well. Though it's recently been overtaken in population by India, China is still a population giant, with over 1.4 billion residents, so it's unsurprising that it would be home to many of the world's largest cities. And indeed, if we look at the 10 largest city propers in the world, six are in China, including the four largest. The largest city in the world, by that measurement, would be the southwestern city of Chongqing, home to 32 million people. I know, you're probably thinking that Shanghai, Beijing, or Guangzhou would be the country's largest, but Chongqing's size comes primarily from the fact that its city limits are physically the size of Austria, including far-off farmland, mountains, and valleys, and what are in practice other cities and towns that are in some cases a five-hour drive away. If we ignore the city limits and look instead at Chongqing's urban area, it's home to a still enormous but much more modest 12 million people. Though not all as physically large as Chongqing, many Chinese cities extend well beyond what most people would reasonably consider to be a city, inflating their populations. The lesson here should be that comparing city proper populations is never an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. A city proper is pretty much the city as an institution. 
It's the definition of the city, not in the sense of I'm going into the city for the weekend, but the city has reduced parking rates downtown. The real value of looking at city proper populations is essentially if you want to compare the influence of various mayors, not if you're interested in looking at larger population clusters and demographic patterns. I'd argue that the urban core of a city and its suburbs cannot be separated from one another. After all, when have you seen a ring of residential suburban development with nothing in the center? Suburban residents often commute into the city, make up much of its workforce, and live in communities closely connected to it by roads and rails. The suburbs cannot exist without the city, and likewise, why should a residential neighborhood 15 miles from downtown in Austin be considered to be fundamentally different from one 15 miles from downtown in Pittsburgh, just because one is in the city proper and the other is not? The U.S. Census Bureau was wrestling with these very questions of how to count the suburbs in the early 1900s, as the United States was undergoing major changes. For much of its history, the United States has been predominantly rural. The vast majority of Americans lived on farms and small homesteads in the country. The country's largest cities were tiny compared to the millions of people living in rural areas. But as the U.S. transitioned from an agricultural to an industrial economy, cities grew and prospered. For decades, the proportion of Americans living in urban areas increased, while the proportion in rural areas declined, and sometime between 1910 and 1920, the urban population for the first time surpassed the rural population in America, and it would only continue to rise. Though American suburbanization as we know it really took off after World War II, by the late 1800s and early 1900s, there were numerous examples of cities that, though far more densely populated and built up than the suburbs that would come later, were clearly within the orbit of another city, like Brooklyn, New York, and Allegheny, Pennsylvania, both of which would be annexed by their larger neighbors, Covington, Kentucky, Cambridge, and Somerville in Massachusetts, and Newark, Jersey City, Patterson, Hoboken, and Camden in New Jersey. In actually all of these cases, these cities lay across a river from their core city. Early pre-war suburbanization mostly saw existing cities that had developed on their own across a body of water from another town wind up within the other one's orbit as urban populations grew. In 1905, the Census Bureau conducted what they called the Census of Manufacturers, analyzing the country's manufacturing statistics. They listed a number of what they called industrial districts, major industrial urban centers, but in doing so, they did something unusual. They wrote that, quote, the manufacturers immediately surrounding the principal cities, which form the centers of these districts, are largely controlled by capital owned by residents of the cities. A considerable proportion of the employees reside within the cities, and the city is frequently the principal distributing point for the products. In other ways, the industries are so closely allied to the cities that they should be credited to the urban rather than to the rural manufacturers, unquote. In short, they were adding the suburbs to the city populations. These industrial districts in an obscure 1905 census report would officially be adopted into the 1910 census just five years later as metropolitan districts and would eventually be renamed metropolitan areas. The Census Bureau says that, quote, the general concept of a metropolitan area is that of a core area containing a large population nucleus together with adjacent communities that have a high degree of economic and social integration with that core." Unquote. Importantly, they used the county as the base levels, the building blocks of the metro area. On top of the county the core city is located in, further outlying counties can also be included should they meet certain criteria for population density, proportions of residents commuting to the core city, urban percentage, population growth, and so on. For example, the Las Vegas metro area consists of just Clark County, while the Milwaukee metro area includes Milwaukee County, along with Ozaki, Waukesha, and Washington counties. The 10 largest metro areas in the country are, again, New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago at 1, 2, and 3, with 19.5, 12.8, and 9.3 million residents each, populations far larger than their city propers were home to. At number four is Dallas with 8.1 million, surpassing its fellow Texan city, Houston, and fifth at 7.5 million. In sixth is Atlanta, followed by Washington, D.C. in seventh, both home to 6.3 million people, and both cities that didn't make the list of largest city propers at all. 
Philadelphia is 8th at 6.2 million, and in 9th is another city that wasn't on the city proper list either, Miami at 6.2 million, followed by Phoenix in 10th at 6.1. Along with more of a mix of southern and northern cities, this list includes a number of cities whose city propers are quite small. Washington, D.C. is 23rd in the list of U.S. city propers, Atlanta is 38th, and Miami is 44th. In each of these cases, the core cities are fairly small in comparison to the rest of the metro area. Washington, for example, is hemmed in by its location within the District of Columbia, which at just 68 square miles prevents the city from expanding its jurisdiction any further, but whose suburbs sprawl into neighboring Maryland and Virginia, each of which have more people in their D.C. suburbs than live in the district itself. Still though, it makes up the central urban core of the metro area, boosting its population through inclusion of the suburbs. While the metro area solves the problem of counting the suburbs, it comes with its own significant problems. Once again, problems of scale. This time, they stem not from inconsistencies in what's included within the city proper, but from the use of the county as the unit of scale for the metro area. While some counties are entirely urban, like those that make up the boroughs of New York, most are not, even those home to major cities. Clark County, for example, is home to 2.3 million people, thanks largely to Las Vegas and its suburbs. But most of the county's land is sparsely populated desert. You can drive an hour and a half from parts of Clark County before you even reach the outskirts of Las Vegas, yet people living in small towns like Searchlight are still included within the Las Vegas metro area. In Arizona, Coconino County is 18,661 square miles, larger than Maryland in eight other states, but the entire county is designated as the Flagstaff metro area. This smallish college town does not sprawl across more land than the state of Massachusetts, but because metro areas are broken down only as far as the county level, that's what we're left with. Back in Nevada, Reno is located in Washoe County, so it's included in the Reno metro area, but Washoe County extends all the way to the Oregon border, 170 miles north of the city. I could go on and on. Well, in the West, problems arise from the huge size of Western counties. Across the country, rural areas are included in metro areas despite not being urban in character at all, and in the densely populated Northeast, the string of cities whose suburbs often overlap are divided up pretty inconsistently. Wilmington, Delaware, for example, is included within the Philadelphia metro area, while Trenton, New Jersey, a similarly distinct yet overlapping city, roughly the same distance from Philadelphia as Wilmington, is considered to make up its own metro area. The New York City metro area extends through New York and northern New Jersey, but stops at the Connecticut border. In a few cases, locations are given metro area status that are in practice quite suburban. Like Orange County, California's Inland Empire certainly has its own sense of regional identity, but functionally, cities like San Bernardino, Ontario, and Riverside are suburbs of Los Angeles. But sure enough, they're classified as their own metro area separate from LA, one that stretches through the Mojave Desert 200 miles east to the borders with Arizona and Nevada due to the massive size of San Bernardino and Riverside counties. The problem with the metro area is the same problem with how China measures city limits. They are physically way too big. With the city proper including too little of the city, and the metro area including land that clearly isn't part of the city, surely there's some sort of in-between that takes into account the city and its suburbs, but not far-flung rural areas. That's what brings us to the urban area. The concept of the urban area is all about land use. Any area of built-up, continuous development with at least 5,000 people is considered an urban area, and this is how the Census Bureau delineates the percentage of the population living in urban versus rural areas, which right now is about 80% urban and 20% rural. So if you live in an isolated small town, but it has 6,000 people, officially you'd count towards that 80% of urban residents. The benefit of urban areas is that the scale is incredibly detailed. They're pieced together not in counties, but in census blocks, the most detailed level of measurement the census uses, typically just a city block or two, and averaging just a thousand people in population. Because of this, urban areas represent built up land, that moment when the farmland ends and the housing developments begin. Most urban areas in the US are larger in population than their respective city propers, but cutting out rural land are smaller than the metro area populations. This isn't always the case though. In Alaska, for example, many cities, like is the case in China, have enormous city limits that stretch far into the wilderness. 
Anchorage, Alaska's largest city, stretches deep into the Chugach Mountains east of the city, and there are a number of settlements like the community of Girdwood that are part of the municipality of Anchorage but are physically disconnected from the rest of the city, leaving the urban area population, 249,000, smaller than that of the city proper population, 287,000. Because of the detail of the scale, urban areas are our best truly apples to apples comparison. We know we're looking at the same thing across the board, and this, along with the fact that it represents the idea of what I think in practice defines a city better than either the metro area or city proper, is why I personally favor the urban area over the other two methods. The concept can be applied internationally as well. With it, the largest city in the world is not the area inflated Chongqing, but Tokyo. In the US, the list is fairly similar to our list of metro areas, with some key differences, and the populations, though similar, are all somewhat smaller. Again, we have New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago rounding out the top three, this time with 19.4, 12.2, and 8.7 million people each. In fourth this time, though, is Miami, with 6.1 million. Miami is able to leapfrog from ninth in metro areas to fourth in urban areas because the metro and urban areas only have a difference of about 100,000 people. They're so close in size because the urban strand that makes up South Florida is carved out of the swamp. To its east is the Atlantic, and to its west are the Everglades, which are practically uninhabited. Because of this, cutting out the rural population of the counties Greater Miami spread throughout takes relatively few people out of the equation. In fifth is Houston at 5.9 million, followed by Dallas and Philadelphia at 5.7 million, Washington DC at 5.2 million, Atlanta at 5.1, and Boston in 10th at 4.4 million. While I'd argue that the urban area is the best way to count urban populations, it's not without its flaws. Namely, a number of urban areas in the list are suburbs in most senses of the word. Why some cities that are functionally suburban and connected to larger urban cores like Mission Viejo, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Santa Clarita with Los Angeles, Ogden and Provo with Salt Lake City, and Goodyear, Arizona with Phoenix are considered separate urban areas, I have no idea. Just as with metro areas, I'm pretty critical of urban areas on a few occasions where they choose to either break up or consolidate two urban populations that are in close proximity but somewhat distinct. Now, most cities have some suburbs with tall high-rises, but there are a few urban areas with multiple cores, creating cities that are not the central core of their urban area, but are densely populated, built-up economic hubs in their own right, and it feels kind of wrong to call them suburbs. This phenomenon is sometimes called a conurbation or a metroplex. Some examples are New York City, Newark, and Jersey City, Dallas and Fort Worth, Seattle and Tacoma, Raleigh and Durham, and Minneapolis and St. Paul, to name a few. Sometimes, like with Raleigh and Durham, these are split into separate urban areas. In most cases, they're counted as one. The strangest decision, in my opinion, though, was how the Bay Area was divided up. I grew up in California and spent a lot of time in the Bay Area, and it can best be described, in my opinion, as a single urban area with three urban cores, a primary core in San Francisco, and two distinct and important but secondary ones in San Jose and Oakland. It's divided, though, into two urban areas, one combining San Francisco and Oakland, and another centered on San Jose. What's particularly strange here is that while the three cities make up a continuous ring of urbanization surrounding the San Francisco Bay, taking San Jose out of the equation means that San Francisco and Oakland, which keep in mind are being combined here into one urban area, are completely separated by the bay. Now, I have a theory in mind here. San Jose is considered separate because when comparing city propers, it's actually larger than San Francisco. If we get down to brass tacks though, you'll see that this is because San Jose takes up nearly four times as much land. It's been much more effective at annexation than San Francisco, which is hemmed in on a small peninsula. And listen, San Jose is a great city and it's got a really nice downtown. But San Francisco has more than three times the population density of its South Bay counterpart. Comparing skylines probably isn't a fair measurement because the location of the San Jose airport really caps how tall the city can build downtown, but if we look instead at office space, San Francisco has nearly three times as much. The cities have intertwined economies, they even share the same transit systems, yet they're considered to be separate urban areas. 
If the two were combined, the San Francisco Bay Area would clock in at 8th in the country, surpassing Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Boston with 5.3 million people. The urban area is supposed to represent urban patterns, blind to the political realities of city limits. That's why the Anchorage urban area is smaller than the city itself. Yet with it, there remain a few instances where the realities of city propers seem to be having an impact on how urban areas are designated. After all, if the suburbs of New York consolidated into one unified city, it would surpass the five boroughs in population. But really nothing essential about the city's urban form would have changed at all. New York City as we know it would still be at the center. There's so much more I could have talked about here, but that can be for future videos. Go leave a comment and let me know which of the three you think is the best way to measure the populations of the places we live, or if you think there's a better way that's entirely different. I'm interested to know what you think. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.